All right, buenos dias, mis amigos. All right, so today I'm going to go over three videos, and I don't know exactly where this is going to lead me, but I want to show you how how wrong these guys are. <laughs> There's really no way to put it. It's incredible that there are, is deceiver after deceiver, liar after liar. It's unbelievable. And so, just so you know, I want to show you the spirit of air and then show you the spirit of truth. Alright, and I believe in this method. It works for me personally to see the air and then to know the truth and so this is how I want to apply teaching so that you might understand when you can see the air and then see the truth okay so let's go to this video Lion of Judah okay and the title is before the second coming of Christ these two things will happen in the world I might have issue with the title alone. Let's listen to a little bit of what he has to say. The apocalyptic passage of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 reveals to us what will happen before the second coming of the Lord. 2 Thessalonians 2? Is that what he said? 2 Thessalonians 2. Let me make sure. Thessalonians chapter 2 reveals to us what the apocalyptic passage of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 reveals to us what will happen before the second coming of the Lord. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verses 3 through 4. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. The two Bible verses tell us that before the coming of the Lord Jesus, two things need to happen. One, Paul literally said Jesus will not come until there is a great falling away in the church. Two, the man of sin, which is the Antichrist in person. The reveal of the man of sin. The scriptures foretell the emergence of an individual in history who will be... No, 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 that's not what the scripture reveals at all. Hold on. ...be influenced by Satan and will bring deception to many. This person will particularly deceive those who reject the truth, utilizing deceptive miracles to mislead them. Known as the man of sin or the son of perdition, he will be a master deceiver capable of misleading people from all walks of life, from the highest to the lowest, the educated to the uneducated, influential leaders to ordinary citizens, those with religious or secular beliefs. None will be immune to his deception. The Antichrist's activities will be shrouded in mystery, fueled by the hidden power of Satan and accompanied by counterfeit miracles, false signs, and deceitful wonders. All right, so that that is true with the with the one exception this is not an individual it's not some little kid born with a tattoo on his head all right it is hey, let's do it this way let me just show you I'm not sure if I'll go further but this is important if you want to understand you know the Bible <laughs> really yeah it's important to know the Bible right so this verse here who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshiped so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God showing himself that he is God this parallels what we read in the book of Daniel all right I gotta think about it oh here we go All right, so let's go to um, there. I 
there. Okay, right there it is. Okay, so if we just open this up, let's open this up here. Daniel chapter 11. Now, if you, you, you ought to know the book of Daniel, okay? Uh, Daniel's got 12 chapters, takes about 5 minutes to, if you're slow like me, it takes about 5 minutes a chapter. So you can read the whole entire book in an hour. And when you read it, you ought to know, this is undisputed, or indisputable. This is speaking of the fourth king, because... Daniel talks about four beasts until the end of the world. Okay? And then the he's the four beasts are four kingdoms and then of course the fifth kingdom is the everlasting kingdom. All right? You ought to know that. Now if you ought to if you know that then you ought to know that this is talking about the fourth king or the fourth kingdom or the fourth beast and then you ought to know that um, this is uh, not one man but a kingdom and the king of the kingdom is um, what this is speaking of and in Daniel 11 uh, uh, we're gonna read a parallel verse here all right where this is this lines up exactly with what we're reading in second Thessalonians 2 let me read it for you and the king shall do according to his will and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god and shall speak marvelous things against the god of gods and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished for that that is determined shall be done neither shall he regard the God of his fathers nor the desire of women nor regard any God for he shall magnify himself above all who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worship so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God showing himself that he is God these are direct parallels and this is talking about a uh, king and his kingdom and so if we go to Revelation 17 there is no contradiction in the Bible whatsoever there's a whole bunch of people that do not understand and that's why I feel it's so important to uh, talk about this stuff so that people might think about what they're reading all right, here in Revelation 17, it says there are seven kings. Five are fallen, and one is, and the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth and is of the seven, and goeth into perdition. Now, this is important to understand because this is talking about a succession of kings. All right, so that right there eliminates this idea of one little kid being born with a tattoo on his head. It's not one man. This is you get this idea from Hollywood movies, not from the Bible. You know this idea that there's going to be one man that's going to rise up. Maybe it's Barack Obama, or maybe it's Bill Clinton, maybe George Bush, maybe Ronald Reagan's going to come back from the dead. No, that's never going to happen. It's never ever going to happen and it I mean even if it did it won't obviously but even if it did it has nothing to do with the Bible that's not what it's talking about it's talking about a succession of kings just like we read in the book of Daniel you know Daniel he mentions the first three kings the first three of the four kings and the first one is the king of Babylon the second one is the king of the Medes and Persians and the third one is the king of Grecia or Greek so we got the Babylonian Empire we got the Medes and Persian Empire and we got the Greek Empire and the fourth one is not mentioned by Daniel 
and we know that the Greek Empire is the third empire right so come uh, Jesus when he's born when the gut when Matthew Mark Luke and John are written we know that the Greek Empire is no longer in power and we know who the fourth beast is you know there's lots of examples but I just want to uh, use this one to me it's the clearest one the clearest verse to show that the Roman Empire is the fourth empire the fourth beast and it came to pass in those days that went that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed so it's crystal clear the Roman Empire is the fourth kingdom all right and then speaking of the fourth king in the kingdom the and the king shall do according to his will and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god and shall speak marvelous things against the god of gods and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished for that that is determined shall be done neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor regard any God, for he shall magnify himself above all who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worship, so that he is God, set in the temple God, showing himself that he is God. Now, who is this? This is not somebody that's going to come in the future because we read in Luke 2, he's already here. He's already here. The, that kingdom is already here. Now, you noticed here, it says, um, the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth. If you scroll up a little bit, you see when they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. This is the transformation of a physical empire into a spiritual empire. And this is why this fourth beast is called the great whore because she pretends to be the wife or the bride of Christ and she is not she's a prostitute she's a fake wife all right that should be pretty easy pretty simple for people to understand you know a married man that goes off and you know uh, goes to a you know prostitute th that prostitute is performing the duties of the wife well the same thing here this whore pretends to be the wife, but she, she is not the wife. All right. <laughs> I mean, it's clear as day. Who, who does that in the world today? There's nobody in the world today that does it like the Roman Catholic Church. Now, we know that the Roman Empire is in power during the time of baby Jesus. All right. So the Roman Empire is the fourth beast. And the Roman Empire transformed into the Roman Catholic Church. It's obvious. It's obvious. Okay? That's important to understand. Because when you read, like for example, 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 3 says, Let no man deceive you by any means. But that's a stern warning. Now we get that these warnings all over the Bible, right? And Jesus is asked, "What is the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world?" And the very first thing he says is, "Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I, Jesus, am Christ, and shall deceive many." And we get warnings all over the Bible about evil men and seducers waxing worse and worse deceiving and being deceived I mean it's it's all throughout the Bible right Matthew 12 or Matthew 14 verse 12 because iniquity shall abound the love of many shall wax cold Right? Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. 
all right so at this time when this is written the transformation from the physical empire into the spiritual empire speaking of the Roman Empire had not yet occurred but it was gonna occur we were warned of it and <laughs> the book of Revelation speaks a lot about it all right but it's happened and why has it happened it's because of the falling away there are fewer and fewer people that are saved and um, the only way that the Antichrist can gain in power is if people don't recognize who he is and that's exactly what's going on today all right now I, I've showed this um, I, I gotta show it every time I think it gets lost it doesn't get talked about enough for sure but in Luke chapter 18 um, there's a great question being asked here I tell you that he will avenge them speedily nevertheless when the Son of Man cometh shall he find faith on the earth right that day shall not come except there come a falling away first and that man of sin be revealed so there's gonna be fewer and fewer and fewer people that are saved and if God were to let things play out there would come a point where there would be nobody saved right but for the elect's sake uh oh is it not here I don't remember but for the elect's sake those days shall, shall be shortened I think it's in Matthew and Mark specifically specifically written that way where it says um, in Matthew 24 where it says except those days be shortened there should no flesh be saved but for the elect's sake those days shall be shortened and why it's because there are so few people saved that if God let things play out there would be nobody saved except there come a falling away first right that day shall not come except there come a falling away first so we're in decline we're in spiritual decline as a people here living on the earth All right and it's leading to a point to where there would be nobody saved is that clear because once you understand that then all of this makes sense doesn't it right and then who opposes himself who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God well I mean a guy calls himself the Holy Father and you don't think he's exalting himself you don't think he's showing himself that he is God he calls himself the representative of Jesus on earth are you out? you're blind yeah there's something wrong with your heart if you can't see it now if you're a new believer and you're trying to learn I get it but if you've been, a, a, you know, if you've been to, you know, if you've been around for a while, you ought to be able to see it, really. You know, I don't know. Maybe I'm being too strong. But it's crystal clear. Just open your eyes and look and see and believe what you read in the Bible believe what you read in the Bible believe the Word of God why would you want to lean on men for understanding when nobody has greater understanding than the Lord God who wrote who writes the Bible right God this is again this is from God this is not man's version this is directly from God now um, so that's important to understand and so it's not a my point here is it's not a child born with a tattoo on his head the Bible is very clear so uh, Daniel speaks of the four kings or the four kingdoms until the end of the world and then the fourth king or the fourth kingdom 
is the fourth beast, right? And that's the beast of Revelation. And just so uh, you know that I'm not making this up. Daniel 7 verse 17. These great beasts which are four are four kings which shall arise out of the earth. And he names them and everything. All right, let's continue. The source of the Antichrist's deceptive power lies in the depths of hell as he is energized by the god of deception himself. This dark force will grant him the ability to carry out his deceitful agenda. Yeah, so that's true. So the the beast gets his power from Satan. I think it's Revelation 13, isn't it? Oh my goodness. I, maybe I don't know what I'm talking about here. Come on. Where does he get his power from? Right there. I see that. No, 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 and the beast which I saw was like an elliptor, and the dragon gave him his power. So the the dragon gives his power to the beast, the dragon being Satan, and the devil, and the serpent. Alright, it's all the same thing. So the beast, which is the Roman Catholic Church, gets its power from Satan. The scripture is clear. And you think about um, Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, where it says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any creature that the Lord God had made. Right? And he, and what's he do? What's the very first thing he does? He gets Eve to doubt the Word of God. And so what is the Roman Catholic Church doing today? It's getting people to doubt the Word of God. All these modern versions in the English language today are translated from Vatican texts every single one of them and they do so and they change it just enough to abide by copyright laws so that they can make money and the root of all evil is the love of money everything lines up man it's incredible all right so I'm not sure that there's more leading multitudes astray and causing great confusion and spiritual harm he will exploit the weaknesses and vulnerabilities of humanity appealing to their desires and preying on their lack of discernment yeah right so ex th this is true except this should be a video or image of the Pope. It's not going to be... What, what, what is this, a politician in your mind? If you had read Revelation 17, you would have known that the Pope reigns over all the presidents, all the kings of the earth. All roads lead to Rome. I'm not sure there, there was any more I wanted to share on this one. Let's move on. All right, so I want to talk about the DLM Christian lifestyle. And the title of this video is What Will Happen at the End Times, the Second Coming of Jesus. And so, I let's see here. Everyone will see Jesus. That's right. And that's, so that's a monumental event. It's the great day of the Lord. It is judgment day. The second coming of our Lord is, is when we are raptured. All right, very simple, straightforward stuff. All right, so by his own omission, I'm, I'm running through this because I got a point to make here. But... Um, by his own words that he says that when Jesus comes in the clouds that there is judgment on all unbelievers and he's right he's absolutely right I mean that's the Bible that's I mean this is from Genesis to Revelation it's all throughout the Bible when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven it is the end of the world it is judgment day it is the harvest, it is the separating of the sheep and the goat and the wheat and the tares. It is judgment day. No question about it. Now, 
<clears throat> okay, so he talks about the Battle of Armageddon. Again. It's interesting to me. It just is. And I don't know why exactly, but it's just fascinating and interesting. You got movies and you got books and you got all this and all that over one word in the Bible. I mean, I don't know. You're making a big deal out of one word that's in the Bible. Yeah, but then you look at the word Lucifer mentioned one time in the Bible. It's interesting to me. Okay? I don't know why. Just why do people make such a big deal out of small things? Fulfill all the Old Testament prophecies about himself, the Messiah. Okay, so let's continue. Alright, this is where I'm getting to here. So you got Jesus coming in the clouds of heaven. Alright, and then you got the battle of Armageddon. 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 Alright, so this is... I mean, this is it. The judgment of God. Alright, and the, bar, the battle of Armageddon... Is that really a, much of a battle? I mean, uh, the bad guys are going to get destroyed. Right, it's not not really much of a battle, is it? Okay, so where are we at here? Oops, that's next. All right, so it's going to be the end of the world. At the end of the world, there's a new heaven and a new earth, except now this is where it gets goofy. Now, the Millennium Kingdom will start. Right <laughs> What? So, by his own description, all the bad guys are wiped out. Alright? It doesn't make any sense. Here, I, I gotta let him talk. Right after God is victorious, you will reign on Earth. God is victorious. Is he? For 1,000 years, the Millennium Kingdom. Revelation 20, verse 4. Then I See, that's a, a heck of a statement to make. God is victorious. And then there's a thousand year, the Millennial Kingdom. It, it, it's not... No, 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 no. After the end of the world, then is the everlasting kingdom. It's not a thousand year kingdom. What are these people doing? It's incredible, man. And, you know, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on this, but in Revelation 20 is the only time when you hear about this thousand year period. And, you know, the first thing that really jumps out at me is it's not talking about Jesus reigning a thousand years, it's talking about they, which is those of us which are saved, we live and reign with Christ during this thousand years. Now it's interesting, this guy points to, oops, this guy points to, and I saw thrones, and seated on them were those to whom the authority to judge was committed. That's not what it says. It's incredible, man. It's incredible. Incredible. It really is. Okay, so, and I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. Judgment has already been given to us that are saved. Alright, that's important. Very, very important to understand. Judgment has already been given to us judgment has already been given to us whosoever lives and believes in me shall never die judgment has already been given to us and the judgment is everlasting life when we are born of the Spirit of God we have everlasting life nothing can ever take that away the judgment has already been determined the judgment has already been made. It's already been. We sit on thrones right now. 
if you would have read Revelation chapter 1 yeah, I don't know if people are skimming through the Bible or what is going on well I know what's going on is that they're listening to other men and they're not believing what the Bible actually says Revelation chapter 1 and God has made us kings and priests unto God and his father we are kings right now we are kings right now and we sit on thrones right now that's what a king does sit, we sit on heavenly thrones not the earthly thrones that's for the wicked the heavenly thrones are for the righteous all right and think about this now this is just even I mean however you want to spin it all right and I saw souls of them that were beheaded for the witness that's happening right now all right one thing you can't do is say that this is gonna happen after the thousand years all right. it doesn't work and I'm not sure if anybody teaches that and I saw thrones and of them that were beheaded I'm sorry I'm, and I saw excuse me and I saw souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the Word of God which had not worshiped the beast neither his image neither received the mark in his forehead or in their hands and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years so this is going on during this thousand years and of course uh, <laughs> I want to show you that the idea that only people with no heads are gonna be living during the thought that's stupid All right, it's just stupid to say the only is there any other qualifications here and I saw the souls of them or be headed for the witness of Jesus which had not worshiped no there's no other no other qualification so and you've and I've heard it maybe you haven't I've heard people suggest that only these people will be living in this thousand years after Jesus returns okay I mean it's just about as stupid as it gets but that's I've heard it and so that for a thousand years apparently there's gonna be zombies walking around without a head all right so it doesn't make any sense at all no matter how you spin it there's only one way to interpret this and that is we are in this thousand years right now all right but the rest of the dead will live not again until the thousand years were finished this is the first resurrection but the rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years are finished so what happens we it's pointed unto men once to die and then after this the judgment all right so it's clear that at the end of the thousand years is judgment it is appointed unto men once to die and then after this the judgment all right it is appointed unto men once to die and after this the judgment it's appointed unto men once to die and then after this the judgment so the rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years were finished so at the end of the thousand years judgment now this in Revelation 20 calls it the first resurrection blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection on such the second death has no power but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years I mean it's on um, it's so easy it's so easy what is the first resurrection well some people say it's headless zombies roaming around without a head for a thousand years 
But the Bible is very clear. The Lord Jesus Christ himself says, I am the resurrection. Jesus is the first resurrection. The Bible's very clear. This is simple stuff, man. This is not rocket science. You don't need 27 years of seminary school to learn this. You need two minutes to read first. <laughs> read anything, really. But in 1 Corinthians 15, it talks about Christ being the first fruits. Afterward, they that are Christ at his coming. Then comes the end, for he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. So Jesus is the resurrection. We are partakers of his resurrection. Right now, the second death has no power over us. Whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. The second death has no power over us. Jesus is the resurrection. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. The second death has no power over us that are born of God. We shall never die. We shall never, ever, ever die. We have eternal life and nothing can ever take that away. Remember when I, I, I uh, quoted this from Revelation 1? It has made us kings and priests. Made us kings and priests. Here in Revelation 20 it says, And I saw thrones and they that sat upon them. Talking about kings. Which we are kings of God. And we are priests of God. Right? The second death has no power over us, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ. And has made us kings and priests of God, or unto God and His Father. So, if we go to Exodus 19, for example, verse 6, it says, Ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and an holy nation. Alright, so we are a kingdom of priests. Right now we are kings and priests. We are a royal priesthood. Right now. Right now, if I can remember where it's at. Oh, goodness. Yeah, there it is. I thought I was wrong. Okay. <laughs> In First Peter chapter 2, ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood and holy nation talking about those of us that are born of the Spirit of God those of us that are saved we are a kingdom of priests we are a holy nation a royal priesthood a peculiar people a peculiar treasure above all people right now They shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. It's a unique time period, isn't it? Because Jesus has come and Jesus has went and Jesus has promised to return for us. All right. And um, let's, go, let's go someplace. Let's go to John 14 real quick. John 14. Jesus says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may, may be also. And whither I go, ye know, and the way ye know. See, Jesus has died. You see, he can't, he's been, Jesus is God Almighty. He was manifest in the flesh. He lived in this temple that we live in. And he has destroyed this temple. 
and he's rebuilt the temple and ascended to heaven and promised to return for us. See, he has led the way for us. Just as Moses led his people out of Egypt, out of the wickedness of Egypt, so also does Jesus, so also will Jesus lead us out of this wicked world. All right, and when he leads us out of this wicked world, he's going to bring us into a world of everlasting life, a world of an everlasting kingdom wherein dwelleth righteousness, right? Where there is no more pain, no more sorrow, no more suffering, no more death. We're putting our hope into eternal life, not a thousand years. We're in a thousand year period right now. And when the thousand years are expired, it's the end of the world. All right. It's the end of the world. All right. So let's, let's go back to this guy here where he says, okay, judgment on all unbelievers. When Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven, judgment on all unbelievers, the battle of Armageddon, which is the same as the wrath of God going to be poured upon the earth and then and he even so much as says that the victory 1000 years the millennium kingdom revelation 20 verse 4 Wait, earth I, will I thought he said it anyways let's listen now the millennium kingdom will start right after god is victorious there it is Vic right after god is victorious all right, in 1 Corinthians 15, when Jesus comes in clouds of heaven, we are transformed into our glorified bodies. We are changed from corruptible into incorruption, from mortal into immortality. Then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. All right, so death is swallowed up in victory. Hallelujah. All those things are now put behind us here's the problem he now says there's a thousand years coming you will reign on earth for one thousand years no that's not what the Bible says uh, first of all I mean <laughs> I guess he doesn't believe Luke Chapter 1, verse 33, when it says, He shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. It's not a thousand years, fellas. It's eternal. It's forever. Alright, so this guy has, um, by, by his own words, he says that... Um, you know, everybody going to see Jesus, the judgment is you know, made, and the wrath of God is poured upon all the unbelievers, and then a thousand years, and then at the, after the thousand years, as the Bible says, let's see, let me, where are we at here? And then when the thousand years are expired, then Satan goes out to gather his people. Well, wait a second. All the unbelievers have already been judged. Uh, the judgment for all the unbelievers has already been judged. They've already been judged. And the wrath of God has already been poured upon the earth. And then he says there's a thousand years. And the Bible says that the after the thousand years... You see it? So after the thousand, after the judgment of God, you know, after all the unbelievers have been judged and they have been killed, destroyed, the wrath of God is poured upon them. And now all we have are saved people. Because that's, I mean, that's, that's it. And we have victory, right? Victory. Right, when all this shall happen, 
Then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. So there is no more death. And, but then he says, well now this is coming a thousand year period. And at the end of the thousand years, Satan is loosed and he gathers together his people to battle. Well, wait a second, all, there's, all that is left are saved people. There is no more death. The death is swallowed up in victory. And here you got Satan being loosed. And then you got him gathering together his people. And then you got fire coming down from God out of heaven and devouring them. What? That already happened. Why would it happen again? All the unsaved people are killed and then they're killed again? There's already been, death has already been swallowed up in victory. So death is swallowed up in another victory? No, if that was the case, then the first victory wasn't a victory at all. I mean, people are so desperate to reject the Word of God that they'll come up with this crazy doctrines. This is a result of people not trusting the Bible that they hold in their hands and they reveal themselves when they talk about these things. It's incredible. They do not believe the Bible. I mean, I don't know how you could believe the Bible, really, and also believe that a thousand years are coming after the end of the world, except somebody tells you that, right? Because you're not getting it from the Bible. Just be honest, man. Just be honest. The Bible is true. But by, and it's going to play out to be true. Every word of it. Every word of the King James Bible is going to be proven to be absolutely true. On that day when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven. Alright, so let's go here. I'm not sure what this is about here. Oh, this is more nonsense, but I'll, Hold on to your I'll try to keep this short, okay? Hold on to your seats. The moment we've all been waiting for is just around the corner. The second coming is about to happen. What does this impending event mean for our world? How will it reshape our lives and beliefs? The rapture is a belief among some Christians, especially in the United States. What? what, what? You mean there are Christians that don't believe that we're going to be transformed into our glorified bodies? They don't believe in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal shall put on immortality. So when this happens, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. You yeah, some Christians don't believe that? Well, what are you talking about, man? In Matthew 24, Jesus says... Uh, that uh, there shall be a sign in heaven there shall be a sign of the son of man in heaven and the angels shall gather together his elect well some Christians don't believe that what, what kind of Christian doesn't believe that that's, that's an astonishing statement to make unless of course you know they're not really Christian they think that at the end of the world all the dead Christian believers will come back to life then those who are still alive will... Yeah, right. So when the angels gathered together his elect, that would include the living and the dead, wouldn't it? All right, that's pretty simple stuff. I mean, really, isn't it? In Daniel chapter 12, if I can find Daniel, there he is. In chapter 12, many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt this is the end of the world right I will join them 
and they will all go up to meet Jesus in the sky. All the saved people, that's true. First Thessalonians 4, 1 Corinthians 15, Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, all throughout the Bible. This idea comes from a Bible verse in Thessalonians that talks comes from the entire Bible itself. Talks about being snatched away. Oh, this there we go. There we go. Talks about being snatched. Snatched away. It's gonna be snatched. It's gonna be snatched away, fellas. And he shall snatch on the right hand and be hungry. Now, that's not that's not what you're talking about, is it? That's not what he's talking about. Shall be snatched away. Shall be snatched. What is he talking about? What is he talking about here? Snatched. Shall be snatched. Well, I think he was talking about first that's the Thessalonians four, I think. Let's oh wait a second. Is this the right verse? Oh yeah, of course it is. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead shall be... The dead in Christ shall rise first. Is, is he possibly talking about verse 17? I, 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 honestly, I don't know. Gonna be snatched away. Gonna be snatched. Yeah, there it is. We'll be snatched. You're gonna be snatched. Then we who are alive, who remain, will be snatched. N T E O G O J B. <laughs> the voice and the W Y C. Gonna be snatched. All right. I mean, that's just interesting to me. Snatched. That's not what it says. Why would you change that? Is, that? is there something complicated? When it says, Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them. And the, is there something, is that too hard to understand? Is the King James, I heard that the King James is hard to understand. So when the King James says they shall be caught up together with them, I just can't understand it. Just, it's, it's hard to comprehend because of the the way it's written, just the style and the, the old English and all of that sort of stuff. Well, <laughs> come on, what the heck is this? Okay, um, let's find snatched. <clears throat> Oops, I must. Do I misspell snatched? Oh, that's interesting. See, in first. Thessalonians 4 caught up together. What's the difference here? What's the difference here? And they shall gather together. All right. So it's different, I guess. That's not the same. Even though it is the same. Caught up together. Caught up together and shall gather together. Caught up together and gather together. It's the same thing. Yeah, all right. I'm making a big deal out of. A small thing, okay. This belief is part of a specific way of thinking about the future called dispensational premillennialism. What? See, this is... What? This is how you confuse people. Bible verse in Thessalonians that talks about being snatched away. This belief is part of a specific way of thinking about the future called dispen... Wait a second. You quoted the Bible and you said this belief... Am I missing something? Away. This belief is part of a specific. You're you're talking about a Bible verse and saying this Bible verse. Specific way of thinking about the future called dispensational premillennialism. It means they see many Bible prophecies as still waiting to happen in the future. It's important to know that this belief in the rapture is relatively new, starting in the 1830s. It's not something that traditional Christianity has always. Well, you're showing images of Catholics and calling it Christian. ...is believed in. Different Christians have different ideas about when the rapture will happen and how it fits with Jesus coming back. Some say it will happen before a period of trouble called the Tribulation. Uh I, I, 
don't know how you say that. I really, how do you say it's going to happen before the tribulation? When the Bible specifically says immediately after the tribulation, he shall send his angels gather his, his elect. I, I don't get it. How do you say it's after when the Bible is crystal clear? Uh, immediately after the tribulation, he shall all send his angels to gather together his elect. How do you. How do you get that one wrong? Others say it will come after. The most popular idea is that it will happen before the tribulation, but not all Christians agree on this. Right. Well. After the tribulation. The angels gather gather his elect. After. After. Right there. Right there. I can read that. After. Now if that said before, immediately before the tribulation, I, you might have a case. But it says after. So the rapture is a belief held by some Christians, but not everyone believes in it. And there are different ideas about when and how it will happen. The Second Coming The Second Coming is a belief in Christianity and Islam that says Jesus will return to Earth. This idea comes from prophecy. Alright. Alright, okay. So let's just confuse all the religions of the world. ...sees about the Messiah, and it's a part of what Christians believe about the end of the world. Other religions have their own interpretations of this concept. According to Christian belief, after Jesus finished his earthly mission and went back to heaven, two angels told his apostles that he would return in the same way they saw him leave. Acts 1.11 Since then, Christ Wait, what? I, I'm making too big of a mission and went back to heaven. Two angels told... Yeah, yeah, Jesus himself said he would return. I quoted... ...told his apostles that he would return in the same way they saw him leave. Acts 1.11 Since then... Christians have been anticipating the second coming. When Jesus comes again, it will be a majestic and powerful event. He will come in great glory to establish his kingdom on earth, marking the beginning of a period called the millennium. No. No, that's not possible. It's not possible. Okay, so for example, Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven and they gather together his elect right and when he, they gather together the elect that is when we are changed in a moment of time and we are lifted up right in 1st Corinthians 15 All right, we put on in corruption and immortality and then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written death is swallowed up in victory so you can't have you can't have this idea that there's a thousand years after Jesus returns you can't I already showed you it's not in Revelation 20 the idea is not found anywhere at all in the Bible. When Jesus comes, it's the end of the world. And this is all throughout the Bible. In Matthew 13, Jesus gives us the parable of the wheat and the tares, and he calls the harvest the end of the world. All right, this is when there's that separation of wheat and tares, the separation of the sheep and the goat, right? The wheat are gathered in his barn, and the tares are bound in bundles and burned. It's the end of the world. All right, and Joel chapter 2, this is interesting. Joel chapter 2, it gives us a description of the end of of the world. Blow ye the trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble. For the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand, a day of darkness and of gloominess, 
a day of clouds and of thick darkness. As the morning spread upon the mountains, a great people and a strong, there has not been ever the like. Neither shall be any more after it, even to the years of many generations. A fire devours before them, and behind them a flame burneth. The land is as the garden of Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness. Yeah, and nothing shall escape them. The appearance of them is as the appearance of horses, and as horsemen so shall they run. Like the noise of chariots on the tops of the mountains shall they leap, like the noise of a flame of fire that devours the stubble, as a strong people set in battle array. Before their face the people shall be much pained. All of the faces shall gather blackness. They shall run like mighty men, they shall climb like the wall I'm sorry, they shall climb the wall like men of war, and they shall march every one on his ways, and they shall not break their ranks, neither shall one thrust another, they shall walk every one in his path, and when they fall upon the sword, they shall not be wounded. They shall run to and fro in the city. They shall run upon the wall, they shall climb up upon the houses, they shall enter in at the windows like a thief. The earth shall quake before them, the heavens shall tremble, the sun and the moon shall be dark, and the stars shall withdraw their shining. And the Lord shall utter his voice before his army, for his camp is very great. For he is strong that executes his word. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible. And who can abide it? Now think about this. This is the very same event that we're reading in Matthew 24. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun shall be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. Right? The earth shall quake before them, the heavens shall tremble, the moon I'm sorry, the sun and the moon shall be dark, and the stars shall withdraw their shining. Same thing that we're reading in Matthew twenty four, Mark thirteen, Luke twenty one, and it is the same thing that we're reading here in Revelation twenty verse eleven, from whose face the earth and heaven flood away. Right, it's the end of the world. All right, this world is going to be destroyed by fire. Right, just like we read in, in uh, Revelation 20, verse 9, fire comes down from God out of heaven and devours them all. And, uh, and in Second Peter 3, I think, if I remember right, I don't remember exactly. Let me think how close am I? Yeah, yeah, this is it, I think. The heavens and the earth, which are now, by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of the ungodly men. The same thing is being echoed all throughout the Bible. The very same moment in time, which is the end of the world. All right, the same thing. Right, the same thing is being talked about all throughout the Bible but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements shall melt with fervent heat the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved what men or persons I e to be in all holy conversation and good godliness looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat all right this is exactly what is being described the very same moment in time here in Joel chapter 2 it's the same thing it's told a little different way. 
to give us an understanding when we when we connect all the dots and we uh, read all these things we find all these things we read it and believe it it gives us a better understanding of what is to come right here before their face the people shall be much pained all faces shall gather blackness right all the earth shall mourn right? all the earth shall mourn Oops. all the earth shall mourn right uh, okay all the earth shall mourn just like what we read in Matthew 24 Mark 13 Luke 21 says men's heart shall fail them for fear because they know it's the end of the world for the day of the Lord is great great for us right but for the unsaved it's very terrible all right, so it's important to be on the right side of this thing and it, it's as important when you're teaching this stuff all right it's very very important to teach people so that they know that the end of the world is coming and when the end of the world comes there is no more opportunity to be saved their opportunity to be saved is right now it's today if they put it off another day it might be too late man and you're, we're gonna look back and think wow I wish I would have done more I wish I could have done more and sometimes there's just nothing you can do but the last thing in the world you want to do is tell the unsaved that they can wait you never want to do that never ever do that that's cruel it's inhumane it's it's evil it's wicked cannot wait there is not a thousand extra years that they have to believe in Jesus that's not ever gonna happen Jesus comes today what are you gonna tell Jesus that he, Jesus got it wrong just look and believe the Bible read the Bible the Bible is very very straightforward very simple tells us the same thing over and over and over and over and we really have no excuse for not seeing this properly alright okay so I think that's it I think that's it when Jesus comes in clouds of heaven then we are changed and then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written death is swallowed up in victory and of course when all that is finished then behold a new heavens and a new earth right and I saw a new heaven and a new earth second Peter chapter 3 um, nevertheless we according to his promise look for a new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness right? no more pain no more sorrow, no more suffering, and no more death. Right? Alright, so that's it. I just want to share that stuff with you. It's incredible to me that there are so many people who are ignorant. They're liars because they believed somebody that was a liar. And they don't trust the Bible that they hold in their hands. And I'm not even sure this is vaguely Christian at all. This could be this could be Mormon for all I know. I don't know. This guy here, he could be a Catholic. I don't know. He's got it wrong. Why can't he see it? Why is he blind? What is he teaching? It's like he's teaching another religion. I mean, it, what he says doesn't even make sense, man. You've got Jesus coming in the clouds of heaven. you got judgment of un unbelievers. <laughs> you got the wrath of God being poured out and then what a thousand years what another final battle so this wasn't the final battle there's another final but he can't connect the dots man he can't connect the dots he wants so desperately for Nicholas Cage to be his hero he so desperately wants to believe in Hollywood movies that he'll of just uh, 
ignore common sense. Just put that on the back burner. Just put it aside. Willingly put it aside and ignore logic of any kind. Just so he can fit this idea that Nicolas Cage is a hero. I mean, I don't know. You just don't want to believe the Bible. Just do not. Just Nicolas Cage. You got to believe in Nicolas Cage. He's our hero. I saw it on TV. You just got to ignore the Word of God. And just try to fit this stuff in with Nicolas Cage and the movie they call The Left Behind. It's incredible. It's it's preacher after preacher. And I was going to show, um, uh, I don't know if I saw a clip of it anywhere. Um, maybe it was at the beginning of this one. Maybe it was the beginning of this one. I don't know where it's, things were blowing up and all that sort of stuff, right? Doesn't matter. All right, who cares? There we go. Right there, we got fires and things blowing up and all that sort of stuff. That's not the sign of the end of the world. The sign of the end of the world is all the deception. Evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse. The love of many shall wax worse. Right? Many deceivers shall come in the world. Right? It's the deception. And uh, Jesus asks a great question. He says, Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? And it's obvious, man. People are not believing the Bible that they hold in their hands. Desperately, desperately want to believe Nicolas Cage, man. He's, he's our superhero. Well, these guys are going to find out different. Alright, and so that's what I want to do. I want you to believe the Bible that you hold in your hands because it is directly from God. I want you to have absolute faith in the Word of God because it's going to play out to be absolutely true. Alright, I get it. You're going to be ridiculed. You're going to suffer persecution and that sort of thing you're gonna go against the grain of this world it's worth it though that this is temporary eternal life is forever right and if, in order to be right you have to be in the minority and the reward is great okay and uh, I'll just end it on on this I appreciate all these comments I want to encourage people to uh, share their comments and present questions even if they don't believe the question they are asking uh, you know the view that they're asking um, just to challenge challenge me and to you know this will help me and you both learn right so I appreciate all these uh, comments and to keep them coming and have you know have peace have peace knowing that god is true